Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 24th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs are meant to illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism through time, and stories of resistance against injustice. Today, we are honored to be joined by Professor Judy Titer Bommel Schwartz and Rebecca Frank, who are both members of the curatorial team for the museum's newest exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. Judy is the director of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research and professor of Jewish history at Bar Ilan University. She is also the co-editor of Researchers Remember, Research as an, area, as an Arena of Memory for Descendants of Holocaust Survivors. Rebecca Frank has been the curatorial research assistant at the museum since December, 2020. She received a BA in history and Jewish studies from Cornell University in 2019, and an MA in Holocaust studies from the University of Haifa in 2020. During her studies, she interned at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, the Jewish Museum, and the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us today. And now I would like to welcome Judy and Becky onto the screen. All right, it's all you. Okay, so. Hello, everybody. I'm Judy Tidor Bamel Schwartz, and I am the director of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University. And I had the, um, the privilege of being a historian curator for the new core exhibition at the Museum of Jer Jewish Heritage in New York, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do. Yehuda Bauer, who is one of the most prominent Holocaust historians in the world, has often said, to be a good historian, you first have to know how to tell a good story. Well, the Museum of Jewish Heritage definitely knows how to tell a good, in this case, a tragic story, and it does so in a path-breaking exhibition that opened there last week. What is so unique about our exhibition? It doesn't just tell a story. It shows you that story in the most material sense, using hundreds of objects, mostly from its extensive collection and repository, graphics, media, all explained by wall texts of different kinds, which we'll show you some of them, along with a comprehensive audio guide that's available on the Bloomberg app. It literally walks you through a flourishing Jewish history into a world that is shaped by hatred of Jews, by antisemitism, and it takes you then deep into the Holocaust, step by step, country by country, story by story, telling you what happened to Jews and other people persecuted by the Nazis and eventually murdered because of that hatred. But its most unique feature is how it tells those stories. It tells it through objects and through the people behind those objects. You know, it's so easy to say 6 million and it is so difficult to understand what 6 million really is. What does that number really mean? And therefore we do it story by story. That's why we look at it one by one. In our opening room, for example, we see a picture of a beautiful two-year-old girl that I'll be showing you later on. Her name is Yochevet Barber. She's standing on a garden path at a summer resort near the city of Vilna, in Lithuania, before the war. She's smiling over her shoulder, a little girl looking at the camera. We see a middle-aged Romanian housewife, Dvora Enzenberg, a mother of 10, who's standing at the entrance to her house and her farm in that area, Jews actually had farms in Mihoa in Bukovina. We follow them and we follow many others throughout the war. We tell their stories through objects that belong to them and to their family. And thus we understand the six million one by one. Therefore we see, for example, Yocheva's miniature child Sefer Torah that she took with her when they were being deported. We see a small metal pot that Yocheva's mother used to cook food in the labor camp, and we'll be showing it to you soon. There's a, a label on the pot that tells you what happened to the family. We see a floor rug that Dvora is standing on in the opening picture, and later on in another room, we're gonna see that same rug. How do we have it? Well, what happened is that when the soldiers came to take them away to deport them, 
Laura's husband, Nachman, was working in the field, standing outside, and the soldiers pulled at him. They wouldn't let him even go into the house to take a coat or, or something to wrap himself in. And he knew that it would get cold at night, so he quickly grabbed up that floor rug. He put it around his shoulders, and that is the only coat that he had when they were deported to Transnistria. That was the rug that he wore as protection from the elements in the Mogilev ghetto until both he and Vora died of hunger in March 1942, one day after the other. And soon we'll be showing you that rug and telling you the story of how it ended up at the museum. And there is so much more, but you'll hear about that within the next few minutes. On a more personal note, looking back after 40 years, there's been more than 40 years of teaching and writing about the Holocaust, Curating this exhibition has been one of the high points of my personal and professional life. Personal because I got to know an incredible group of people, including Becky Frank, who is here with us this evening, Sydney Yeager and others, and professionally because it allowed me the privilege of creating something that I know will touch the hearts of hundreds of thousands of people who will eventually learn about the Holocaust when they visit this exhibition. And they'll learn that the Holocaust happened not just to an amorphous, six million Jews, but to men, women, and children with faces, with stories, and with objects that live after them. And it's upon us to remember them through these objects. And this is what we're doing in this exhibition. Thank you very much for um, being with us today. Just before I hand over the, the microphone to um, Becky Frank, I just want to explain that we're going to be showing you the contents and the design and the objects and a little bit of the texts. But remember, we're not a history book, we're a museum. And therefore we try to include as much as we can. Somebody's always gonna come along and say, but wait, there's this little town that you didn't focus on. That's right. This is to give you a taste of what we have from our collection. And we hope very much that it will make people interested enough to go home afterwards and to try to learn more. That's what I do in my other hat. I actually teach the Holocaust. So we hope that you, I hate to say enjoy. It's like I say to my students, you can't enjoy a course on the Holocaust. I hope you learn a lot this evening. I hope we touch your hearts. Thank you. Becky, over to you. Thank you so much, Judy and Sydney and everyone for joining. Before we get into talking about a number of the specific objects and people's stories, we wanted to just give you a brief overview of the exhibition, of the floor plans and of the different topics that we'll be speaking about in the different rooms. So as you enter the exhibition, the very first hallway is right here the, on the Jewish diaspora. There will be 32 photos, all circa 1930, showing pre-war Jewish life all over the world. It's representing over 20 different countries within those 32 photos. And at the very end of that hallway, there will be a sign that says, many of these Jews were no longer alive by April, 1943. And that's because as you enter this next room, the first room on April of 1943, visitors are immersed into this one month where a microcosm of the Holocaust of a number of different events all occurring at once. So we speak about Passover in April of 1943, about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, about the Bermuda Conference, about the We Will Never Die Memorial Pageant, about deportations from Libya, deportations from Salonika, Greece, about um, crematorium two and three being newly opened at Auschwitz. All of those different events all at once in April, 1943 to show that symphony and cacophony of those events and really the what of the Holocaust. As we move into the second room, it's on Jews and Judaism where we go back in time to share the who. And this is where we speak about Jews, the life cycle from birth to death, the holiday cycle, about Shabbat, about Jewish learning and culture, both religious and secular, about the different Jewish languages, about the different Jewish groups and streams of Judaism. And it's really a celebratory space showing that vibrancy and diversity of pre-war Jewish life. As we move into the next room, it's on historical anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, where we have objects dating back to the 1400s and a historical timeline starting in 1096, mostly dating up until pre-war, so up until 1933, showing expulsions of Jews, blood libels, pogroms, protocols of the elders of Zion, focusing in on French anti-Semitism and the Dreyfus Affair, 
on German anti-Semitism and on American anti-Semitism, Henry Ford, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, Leo Frank trial. We really cover a lot within this room. As we move into the next room, we're showing responses of Jews from 1881 to 1933. So immediately right after learning about pogroms, we speak about many Jews who are emigrating, many to the United States between 1881 and 1933, about political movements, Zionism, socialism, about acculturation and Jews fighting in World War I for their respective nations, Jews fighting against Jews, about Jewish life in Weimar Germany and that assimilation, and then also rising anti-Semitism during that time. In the next room, we touch on Nazi Germany, and it begins with the creation and rise of the Nazi party, Dachau, persecution of other groups, eugenics, Nazi propaganda, book burnings, the 1936 Olympics, explaining the various different Nazi organizations, including the touching on the Night of the Long Knives, on anti-Jewish legislation, persecution, and it culminates at the end in 1938, which the Nazis deemed the fateful year where there was the Anschluss annexation of Austria, Munich Conference, Poland Action, and Kristallnacht Night of the Broken Glass. As we move into the next room, it's on flight and Jewish responses, where it's on Jewish community organizing, struggle to leave, showing that as many Jews wanted to leave, it wasn't always so simple. Many countries wouldn't let Jews in. Emigration efforts and people that were able to leave, the story of the MS St. Louis, the Evian Conference, Dominican Republic, Sosua, letting Jews in, kinder transport, Jews that fled to Shanghai, and also we especially touch on American immigration policies and various different American Jewish responses to Nazism. The final room on the first floor is on Nazi expansion. So really this is where the war begins with the invasion of Poland in September of 1939. Many Jews who fled to the USSR, Nazi expansion and the invasion of Northern, Western and Southern Europe. And as we're speaking about this Nazi expansion and you'll see this later as we speak about objects that are in this room, we're also speaking about how it then affects Jews in the various territories that the Nazis were occupying. And there's a beautiful display in this room of 36 yellow stars that belong to Jews in a number of different countries from Croatia, Hungary, Germany, Belgium, Bulgaria, the Netherlands, showing the variations of Jewish stars and the way that the Nazis expanding affected Jews in that land. As we move on to the second floor, the first room on the second floor is all on ghettos. And so we speak about a number of the different ghettos from the Lodz ghetto to Vilna ghetto, Riga ghetto, Theresienstadt, and about both their establishment, ghetto announcements, Jews moving into the ghettos, what daily life was like in the ghettos with a number of different stories about people and what their time was like there. Spiritual resistance, religious life, cultural life, children, youth movements, Judenrat, Jewish police, ghetto resistance, outside assistance, partisans within the ghettos. And then we touch on liquidation and deportation, which then we pick on later, pick up later on in the exhibition. Move into the next room, which is the final solution in the German conquered Soviet Union. We begin with Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941. And then this room really speaks about killing fields and the Holocaust by bullets, or it's also known as the genocide by mass shooting. It focuses in specifically on the massacre at Bob and Yar. We speak about Jews in Transnistria and about Roma and Sinti that were persecuted throughout the Soviet Union. As we move into the next room on roundups, deportations, and factories of murder, it starts with Operation Reinhard, the Wanze Conference, roundups, deportations, and various different objects that belong to individuals, such as a letter that was written from a deportation train or objects that people either left behind or brought with them when they were being deported, and then about the six death camps. The next room is on hiding, escape, and resistance, where it in general speaks about hiding and the different modes of individuals that hid. And then we focus in on children who are in hiding and various different objects and belongings and stories related to children in hiding. Then escape and various different escape efforts and missions and resistance 
And also we speak in this room about bystanders, upstanders, and collaborators. In the next room, it's all about concentration camps and labor camps and touching on a number of the different camps, speaking about daily life, starvation, spiritual resistance, clandestine culture, and life in the camps and various correspondence in and out of the camps that did exist. The next room is on what the world knew and did, where we speak about news of the final solution and of the Holocaust spreading to the free world, the response of the United States, of Great Britain, of the various allied nations, both what they did do and what they could have done, the War Refugee Board, Global Rescue Stories, and the Ritchie Boys. And in the final room, death marches, liberation, and beginning again, we begin with death marches, then move into liberation, the end of the war, American, British, Soviet liberators, the Jewish Brigade, deep, deep, uh, displaced person camps, kibbutz book involved, rebuilding families and life, mourning, commemoration, rebuilding Jewish life, searching for family, global confrontation with atrocities, the Nuremberg trials, immigration to the United States, pre-state Israel, the birth of Israel, the Displaced Persons Act of 1948, Genocide Convention, United Nations establishment in 1948. And at the very end, we have a final testimony and we'll speak later on in this program about the different videos throughout the exhibition. But the very last video is of survivors' messages. It was really important for the curatorial team to have survivors give the very last word. And as you exit from this last room, you will enter this hallway where there will be 30 photos, 20 of which are in black and white of Jews that did not survive, and 10 are in color of Jews that did survive, showing so much of what was lost and then also those that continued on rebuilding after the war. So that was a very quick overview of everything that we will be touching on. Of course, there's various objects and personal stories immersed with it where we continue to delve into that history, but that's the overall outline of everything that we cover within this exhibition. So as we move on, we'll be sharing select objects and stories from the exhibition, as Judy mentioned, there are about 750 objects on view. 98% of them come from the Museum of Jewish Heritage's collection. Many of them are on view for the very first time in our acquisitions that we're an actively collecting institution. And so there are objects that we acquired within the last few years that people are able to see the objects and learn the stories for the first time and objects that come from our collection that hadn't been on view yet in an exhibition. So in this very first room on the Jewish diaspora circa 1930, here are two examples of photos that you'll see. On the left is a photo and it's of baby Max Lerner and his parents when they were on vacation in Italy in 1927. And Max is someone that visitors are able to follow him throughout the exhibition. There's a number of different individuals that we touch on in one earlier room and then you will see later on and he's someone that you'll see here in 1927, a photo of him as a baby. And then again, a photo of him in the very last room in 2021 of him and his wife many, many years later. And so when you're throughout the exhibition, you can follow him. And for us being able to really connect to these people and their stories was so important. So being able to not only see them individuals in one place, but to really follow them and continue to see Max's life in 1927, and then again in 1939 when his family was fleeing Austria after the Anschluss, and then in 1941 when they came to the United States and he enlisted in the army and became a Ritchie boy, and we'll speak about his story more, but he's someone that you're able to follow throughout, and there's many individuals like that. Here on the right is a photo of Isaac Elias. He was a baby right here in Castoria, Greece, circa 1930 and he did not survive the Holocaust. This photo was actually sent by some of his relatives to surviving family elsewhere. And on the back is an inscription in Ladino explaining who he was and that he was murdered in the Holocaust. Many of the individuals pictured in this room were murdered in the Holocaust. As we move on into this next room, April, 1943, 
Here are three different examples of objects that will be on view. The first is this crematorium brick that was recovered by Miriam Novich, who was a Holocaust survivor and historian and one of the founders of Lohamea Geto'o, the Ghetto Fighters House, Kibbutz and Museum. And she had recovered this crematorium brick right after the war. And because crematoria two and three were newly established in April, 1943, that is why when we discuss Auschwitz and the crematoria there, we show this brick along with another pendant. Here in the center is a tefillin bag where it would house tefillin, which are used for morning prayer and contain scrolls um, with portions from the Torah. So inside this bag was recovered by Rabbi Kalman Farber, who Judy mentioned his daughter, Yocheved Farber, who we will speak about later on as well. And Rabbi Kalman Farber and his wife Zipporah had survived the war. They had actually, after their daughter died, they escaped and they went into hiding. And after liberation, he went to, with us, some other Jewish leaders, to the site of Ponar, which was a killing site, likely where their daughter had been murdered, right outside of Vilna, where about over 100,000 Jews were murdered at the site of Ponar by Nazis and their collaborators. And many of the objects were taken back by the Nazis or were looted by different collaborators, but many different objects were left behind at Ponar, such as this tefillin bag that Rabbi Farber had taken with him. And he didn't know the person that this tefillin bag belonged to, but he took this tefillin bag, another one, and a prayer shawl with him, most likely to remember the Jews that were murdered there. And he took them with him to Israel and then eventually donated it to the museum. Here on the right is a Haggadah that was used in Tunisia in 1943. So in April, on April 19th, 1943 is when Passover was going on around the world. For many Jews in concentration camps, it meant longing for freedom and hoping maybe having a Passover Seder in hiding. For the Jews in Tunisia who were recently freed from Nazi collaborationists, that was them having Passover celebrating that freedom. And around the world, Jews in the United States and in the Great Britain who were able to celebrate Passover, many of them did add prayers to their services and did think about the Jews in Europe and various different efforts that they would be able to make during Passover. They spoke about it at Passover, but then they continued to think about it. As we move on into this next room on Jews and Judaism, on the right, you'll see a text panel from the exhibition. And we wanted to show you some different examples of how we speak about the objects in the show. And within each room, about four to five objects will be highlighted with an additional text panel where we're telling, again, more of the personal story and more that would have not fit on a label, but that we can get into more detail about who the person was. Oftentimes, even if it's within a room where we're speaking specifically about one object, it continues on into the present so that you're able to see that person's life. So these beautiful mikvah clogs, which were gifted to Rachel Rabbi Sutton Mansoura from her eventual husband, Moshe Mansoura, he gave her these clogs for the mikvah, which was the ritual bath for her to wear them for her wedding day. They originally had straps. And as the family emigrated, she passed them on, brought them with her. And her daughter, her great, her granddaughter, her great granddaughter all wore these same mikvah clogs and brought them with them eventually to the United States. And Rachel did come as well to the United States. And she actually died in 1957 at the Sephardic Home for the Aged in Brooklyn. As we move into the room on historical anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, these two objects really speak to the point of this room, which is showing that anti-Judaism existed long before the Holocaust, long outside of Germany. On the left is a letter that's signed by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella following the expulsion of the Jews of Spain of March, of March 1492 they had sent this letter in December of 1492 to this man, Rodrigo de Mercado, who was a leader for a certain commercial center, explaining to him, by that time, after March of 1492, many Jews, about 175,000, had already fled Spain and had already left. And so these, in this letter, he was explaining the instructions 
for what to do with Jewish property that was left behind and for any Jews that were still there. And looking at a letter that's from 1492 signed by the King and Queen of Spain really signifies how historic anti-Semitism really is. On the right is a 1551 proclamation. So on the right of the object on the right, where you can see, I believe you can see my mouse right here. This 1551 proclamation was saying that Jews had to wear this yellow badge right here. Nearly 400 years later, Reinhard Heydrich, who was a Nazi leader and the security police gifted this proclamation on the right to Hermann Goering as a birthday present for his birthday on January 12, 1940. And in it, they explain on this inscription that in only a few years, the Fuhrer Adolf Hitler and his associates had solved an issue of the Jewish problem that the Kaisers and Kings for centuries before them had been trying to solve. And so this object, you can really see the influence that historical anti-Judaism had on key leaders of the Nazi party. This next room on Jewish responses from 1881 to 1933, on the left is a Zionist ball ticket for a Zionist ball at Madison Square Garden in 1920, showing Zionism around the world and that political movement. In the center is an iron cross that was awarded to Herbert Mendel for his service fighting in World War I as a German Jewish soldier. And on the right is a law diploma that was issued to Adolf Hamburger, who he had actually also fought in World War I. And after running a field pharmacy in World War I, he decided to change professions and go to law school. And he went on to you know, develop parts of international law throughout Weimar Germany. And then eventually he fled with his family after he was no longer allowed to practice law and he came to the United States where he continued to fight for refugees and continued to work and practice as a lawyer. In the next room on Nazi Germany, the object on the left is Himmler's personal annotated copy of Mein Kampf. We have both volume one and volume two in our collection, which Heinrich Himmler, a Nazi leader, had annotated in 1926 and 1927 before he was already part of the Nazi party, but it was before he was really the Himmler that so many of us know today as being a key architect of the final solution. And in it, you're able to see his various different notes. Examples are that he had actually underlined a passage where Hitler had wrote that if Germany had gassed 12,000 to 15,000 Jews in World War I, that they would have won the war. And Himmler underlines that. And I think to be able to see that Himmler underlined that passage in 1926, it really speaks volume to then the Nazi leader and his thinking back then for what he would become. His father also read the same copy and he annotated it as well. They had very distinct handwriting. And at the very end, his father wrote that he had read to the end with sincere admiration and respect of this man speaking about Hitler and about Hitler's words, but in many ways, giving Himmler blessing, his blessing to become such a key Nazi leader. On the right is this Taurus scroll that was recovered by Dr. Seligman Baer Bamberger on the night of Kristallnacht, known as the night of broken glass or November pogrom, November 9th and 10th in 1938. And that night, Dr. Bamberger had, with other Jewish leaders, gone to the synagogue to save this town's Torah scrolls in Hamburg, Germany. And the Gestapo had actually gone to his house looking for him, and they couldn't find him because he was at the synagogue saving the town's Torah scrolls. He stayed hidden there for a number of weeks, eventually brought the, this Torah scroll back with him to his home. He was able to escape being deported likely to Dachau because he had been getting and saving this Torah scroll. His family came to the United States in March of 1940 and brought this Torah scroll with them. They continued to pray with it at a number of different synagogues in Long Island before donating it to the museum. In the next room on flight and Jewish responses, this object right here on the right is a piano 
that had belonged to a young girl named Hetty Bear Soroka. Despite it being difficult financially, she loved be playing the piano and her parents purchased for her in Vienna, this Lauberger and Gloss piano that she played as a young girl. And this is her sheet music that she had used. After the Anschluss, her parents decided that the family needed to emigrate due to the rising anti-Semitism and persecution of Jews. And the piano was so important to them that even before visas had arrived for the family, they shipped the piano to some relatives in the United States. And you can't quite fully see it in this picture, but when you come and see the piano in the exhibition, you can see that there are these holes here and markings where the Nazis had actually taken off the sconces from the piano and saved the silver brass sconces while it was in transit and the holes of which they still remain. Hetty herself, her visa came first. So she fled when she was 11 years old by herself. Right here is actually a postcard that she sent to her parents from Paris in 1939 while she was in transit. She eventually came to the United States, so did her parents and she united with both them and with her piano, which she kept with her in her possession until 2021 when she died and her family donated the piano to us afterwards. Here in the room on Nazi expansion, as we mentioned, there are 36 yellow stars showing the different ways of both through the yellow stars and in other documents as well. But this is an example of one where we show about the effects of Nazi expansion on Jews in the different populations. This yellow star belonged to this young girl, Anita Meyer. And so here we're showing you an example too of an object label. And whenever possible, we included a picture of the person whom the object belonged to. So you can see here is Anita Meyer in 1936-37 in school in The Hague in the Netherlands. And she wore this star in The Hague and then she eventually went into hiding in the, south, in the south of the Netherlands in Eindhoven. And she kept a diary, which we also have in our collection and in the exhibition. So she's someone else that you'll hear her story and see her yellow star among the 36 yellow stars. And then you'll see her again later when we speak about hiding and especially children in hiding. Moving on to the second floor, I'll hand it back to Judy. Thank you very much. So now room seven begins our, our tour of the second floor and our first room is devoted to ghettos. If you remember, I spoke at the beginning about Yocheved Farber looking over her shoulder at age two. Uh, here she is, that's that beautiful little girl. In 1939, in Drisniki in Lithuania, she's in a, a summer vacation place. And this is the only picture that we actually have of her as a child before the war. And what we have on the right is the pot that was used by the Farber family to cook kosher food, first in the Vilna ghetto and afterwards in the labor camp, the HKP labor camp, where the family was deported. And from there, Yocheved was taken in a children's action. And if you, any of you can see, there is a, an inscription, there's a label that's pasted on the pot. And it says that in this pot, in Hebrew, in this pot, kosher food was cooked in the Vilna ghetto for a girl who was taken to be exterminated. And this comes from the Afe Elif collection, and it was donated to the Museum of Jewish Heritage by the Center for Holocaust Studies in Brooklyn. These were people. These are their stories. This is what we have left of them. That's all that's left. Let's go on to the next room. The final solution in the German conquered Soviet Union. Here, I, we've chosen to show you two very, very meaningful objects. The first is a beautiful embroidered peasant blouse that everybody can see. That blouse belonged to Chaya Porus. Before that, it actually belonged to her sister, Rachel Porus. Chaya embroidered this blouse as a gift for her sister Rachel's birthday when they were in the Svensoni ghetto. A year later, a friend of theirs, Luba Gurevich, recognized this blouse among the belongings of Jews who had been taken away and murdered in the corner forest. It was obvious what had happened to Rachel. Gurevich took the blouse. She risked her life, actually, to take it and to bring it back to Chaya Porus. Chaya put on the blouse. She wore it when she escaped from the Vilna ghetto and she joined the partisan group Nikama, which means revenge in Hebrew. And as she fought for her life and as she fought to try and save as many Jews as she could, Horace 
kept her sister actually next to her on her skin, wearing this blouse, patching it with parachute silk when it tore, and eventually the family gave it to the museum. On the right, we have a kitchen rug that I mentioned before. This was the rug that was worn as a shawl by Nachman Enzenberg throughout his entire end of his life when he was deported with his family to Transnistria. The rug is of woven flax that was grown in Nachman's field in Bukovina, which was part of Romania between the two world wars, and it was Austro-Hungary before the First World War. The Enzenbergs were Orthodox Jews. They were landowners. This is one of the few places that Jews from the middle of the 19th century were permitted to own land, and many became farmers, including the Enzenberg family. Their children, there were 10 children in the family. They all knew how to ride horses bareback. They all knew how to milk cows, etc. And this was the rug in the entrance home. We have a picture of Nachman's wife, Dora, who's standing on that rug. It's in our entrance room, the corridor that you see the world, the Jewish world in 1930. Anyway, when they were ordered to leave their homes, Nachman picked this up and put it around his shoulders. He draped it around his shoulders like a shawl to keep him, keep him warm from the cold. And you can take a look at the rug. It's fringed. Originally, it was white or had a little bit of blue and gray stripes. It's very discolored today. And Nachman Edzenberg kept this rug with him. He used it in Transnistria. He and his wife, Dora, died in March 1942 from starvation, one day after the other in the Mogilev ghetto. Their daughter, Jenny, was with them, and she survived, and she took this rug. She kept it with her, and in 1999, she wanted to know that it would go to a good home, and she donated it to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. But one of the reasons that I'm pretty close to this is that Nachman Enzenberg was my great-grandfather. We move on to room nine. Roundups, deportations, factories of murders. Becky mentioned before that we have various texts because we're not only showing you objects, we're telling you about them. We can't be with you physically to tell each story, so we've written it up. Every object has a label. Every label has a picture of, if it was possible to get it, the person involved and information about who donated it. But in addition, we also have various stories. Every room has a room introduction story, which is what we've brought you here. This is the room introduction for roundups, deportations, and factories of murder. I'll read it out for those of you who can't see it. In late 1941, the Nazis determined that the most efficient way to annihilate the Jews of Europe would be to gas them at death camps. The Nazis initiated Operation Reinhardt in 1941 to systematically murder Jews in the general government that occupied Poland. At the Wannsee Conference in January 1942, German officials and Nazi leaders were informed of the plans to gas the Jews and coordinated the logistics for a Europe-wide murder operation. Throughout German-occupied Europe, Jews were rounded up by SS personnel, by soldiers, police, and collaborators, and then herded onto cattle cars bound for the East, which was a euphemism for death camps, and they were usually gassed upon arrival. Jews could take position, possessions with them. In some cases, they couldn't. In some cases, they were told to leave everything. This is part of a set of tefillin, phylacteries that Jews use for prayer, that was left behind in an attic after deportation to Auschwitz in 1944. They were found in a transit camp in Mantova, in Mantua, Italy. And these are very small tefillin, and usually they were used for travel. Now, if you notice, it says that this is a gift of Miriam Novich, the Yafa Elich collection donated by the Center of Holocaust Studies. Miriam Novich was one of the most unique women that I had ever had the privilege of meeting. She was a survivor who took upon herself to go back to Europe every year right after the war was over. We're talking about 1946, 47, 48, 49. She moved to Israel at that time, the pre-state Israel. And she went back and she would bring objects, Holocaust-related objects back with her to tell the story. And knowing her, she passed away many, many years ago, she would be honored that things that she brought are actually now going to be on display to tell the story of Jews during the Holocaust, because 50, 60, 70 years ago, that is what she wanted. And now it is happening. Miriam, you have been vindicated. Let's go on, please, to the next room. Room 10. Hiding, escape, and resistance. You see that beautiful little doll? Well, that beautiful little doll has a name, and she's called Durdika. This is a doll that belonged to Eva Bass. Eva Bass was born in Zagreb on March 1st, 1936. And for her fourth birthday, she was given this doll as a present. If you take a look, the doll has a 
hard plastic head and the rest of it is a stuffed body. It's cloth and the eyes open and close. It's the perfect little doll for a four-year-old. You can ask, so what is that object next to Durdika? Well, that is Durdika's passport, believe it or not, because when the family ran away from Croatia in 1941 and they fled to Italy, eventually they made it into hiding in Switzerland in 1944. Eva was at the time eight years old and she was holding Durdika, but she wouldn't leave without knowing that Durdika would make it. So her family put together a passport for Durdika so that they could convince little Eva that Durdika will survive. Now it gets even better. As they're crossing the Alps, Durdika's head, this plastic head, falls off. Now, can you imagine, this is a whole bunch of people that they're risking their lives to find Durdika's head so that Eva Bass will have her complete doll. They found it, as you can see, and they retrieved the head and it traveled in a valise with its own passport. We no longer have Eva with us, but we do have Durdika here in the museum. And that reminds us of the entire story of hiding, of escape, of resistance, and that it happened to real human beings, little girls of eight years old who wanted their dolls with them. And we're going to show it, or we do show it. Room 11, concentration camps. Here's a, a fascinating object. What is this enamel bowl that if you take a good look, it's got a couple of holes at the bottom. This is an enamel bowl that belonged to a family from Libya. You say, Libya? What does that have to do with the Holocaust? Well, it very much has to do with the Holocaust. This bowl was pre-1941 in Libya. And if you read the, this is the object label, it's a gift that I gave to the museum in memory of the Bordia family. And they asked me, what was I doing with a bowl from Libya? Here's the story. About 35 years ago, I was making a series of movies about the Holocaust for where I was teaching. And one of the families that I interviewed was a family from North Africa, from Libya, the Bourbia family, who had been incarcerated in Nazi camps in Europe. Mr. Bourbia had inherited British citizenship from his father and grandfather who had come from Gibraltar. And all the Jews in Libya who had foreign citizenship that belonged to the Allies were first rounded up and put into a concentration camp. And after that, they were deported. First, they were deported to Italy. From Italy, they were deported to a camp and then to Bergen-Belsen. Now, they were permitted to live together as a family. And this is what Mrs. Borbia, Mrs. Dora Borbia, Dora Borbia, took with her. This was the one object that she took from her home to the concentration camp in Libya and then to the camp in Italy and then to the camp in Bergen-Belsen. But it gets even better. She had children. She had a son with them that came to the first camp. But because they lived together as a family, she became pregnant. She had a second son in Italy, and she had a third son when they were in Bergen-Belsen. Now, they also had an entire group of Libyan Jews, including a mohel, a circumciser. And when her son was eight days old by Jewish tradition, she wanted him to be circumcised. Now, try to imagine this. You usually bring a baby on a pillow. Well, you don't have pillows in Birkin Bills. And she took this little baby, eight days old, she put him into this bowl and she handed this bowl to the circumciser and said, make my son into a Jew. And he was circumcised in Birkin Bills and having been brought to his circumcision in the bowl. Now, Mrs. Borby is telling me this whole story as we're making the movie. And when they finish, she's walking out and I run after her. I say, Mrs. Borbia, you forgot your bowl. And she turned around, she looked at me and she said, no, Judy, I left it for you. The bowl has done it for our family, but you teach the Holocaust. I want you to tell this story over and over again so that people know that Jews from Libya were incarcerated in Bergen-Belsen. There were those who lost their lives to the Nazis. We too are Holocaust survivors. And I promised to do it every year. And when we put together this exhibition, I said, this is the place for the bowl. We have to show it. And this way, not only will 20 or 50 students a year see it, but hopefully hundreds of thousands of visitors will know the story of Jews of Libya who were incarcerated by the Nazis and who were Holocaust survivors. And this is in memory of the Bourbia family. Next room. As you can see, we are all very, very invested in this, emotionally invested in this exhibition. It is, it is what we do, and we hope that you will get a lot out of it. Room 12, what the world knew, what the world did. So you have the Jews of Europe and you have the Nazis, but what about the bystanders? What about the people who are watching and does anybody do anything? Here we have two objects. We have a famous cable from Gerhard Riegner from the World Jewish Congress in Geneva to Rabbi Stephen Wise in New York in 1942. And in it, he is trying to give information about the final solution. He writes, received alarming reports stating that in Fuhrer's headquarters, the plan has been discussed and being under consideration. 
in which Jews in occupied countries, three and a half to four million should be sent to the East in one blow exterminated. Well, the State Department didn't believe it. They didn't want to pass it on. And eventually in undercover ways, the cable reached who it was supposed to reach in New York. On the right, we have a portion of the safe haven fence of Oswego, New York. That was the one thing that the War Refugee Board formed in 1944 did to try to save people from the Holocaust. They opened up a safe haven in upstate New York and close to a thousand people were rescued from the Holocaust from Europe and brought there. And this is a portion of the fence that went around the safe haven. Now I'm moving along because we're short on time. Room 13, this is the end, the death marches, liberation and beginning again. What in the world are we doing with an accordion, you may ask? Well, this is another one of the stories that I love. This accordion belonged, believe it or not, to Hermann Goering, arch Nazi. Now, how do we have an accordion from Hermann Goering? The Americans captured Goering, and during the interrogations, he was very uncooperative. He claimed that he didn't remember anything, didn't know anything. Well, he was being interrogated by a bunch of Americans, American soldiers, many of whom were Jewish soldiers who had come from Europe and obviously spoke fluent German. And the commanding officer told these interrogators, take Goering to the officer's club in the evening, feed him a good dinner, fly him with cognac and liquors, entertain him, and so he'll let his guard down. One of them, Ralph Wartenberg, borrowed an accordion and started playing German songs. And at one point, Goering turns to Ralph and he says, whose accordion is that? And Ralph said, I borrowed it. And Goering said to him, I play the accordion. Would you like my accordion? And he actually instructed Ralph to go with Goering's orderly to pick up this accordion wherever it had been. And then he gave it to him as a present. And obviously we got it as a present. So that's the story of Goering's accordion and what it's doing here. And yes, he broke and he actually told stories afterwards about what happened during the war. Our last object that we're showing you is the happy object. It's a wedding canopy, a chuppah, that was manufactured by the JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee for Use in DP Clans. It was manufactured in pre-state Israel, and this one was found in the Fernwald Displaced Persons Camp. And we're showing it because after the war, liberated Jews wanted one thing. They wanted to get their lives back on track. They wanted to get married. They wanted to have children. Every marriage, every child that was born after the war was a victory over what the Nazis wanted to do. I'm one of those children. I'm a victory over the Nazis. The fact that I am alive is an incredible miracle. Let's go on from there. Here we have a couple of quotes that we brought to show you what we're talking about when we speak of texts. It's not only a text explaining an object. It's people who went through the Holocaust who tell us what they felt. The quote on the left is by Joseph Bamberger, who's a Holocaust survivor from Germany. And he says, this is from the Bamberger Torah scroll that you've seen. The most important item in our suitcase was one of the Torah scrolls that my father had rescued from the Bornplatz synagogue on Kristallnacht. On the right, we have a quote from Eric Livingston, a Jewish refugee from Germany to the United States who said, Hitler would have let me go at that time. It was America who didn't let me in. Moving on to our next slide, this is already from our last room. This is liberation. On the left, we have a quote from Rabbi Herschel Schachter, US Army chaplain, who was one of the liberators of Buchenwald. And he said, I saw pallets with people who stared at me wide-eyed. I shouted excitedly, Shalom Aleichem Yidin, ich sein frei, ich bin ein Amerikaner, oh, greetings Jews, you're free. I'm an American rabbi. And on the right, we have a quote from Chaskel Tidor, who was one of the Jews liberated by Herschel Schachter in Buchenwald, and who said many years ago, we survived by chance but knew we had a purpose to make a better world for Jews, for everyone. And yes, Askel Tidor was my father. So we would now love to show you some of what the exhibition actually looks like through these design elevations. We should say these are the final design elevations. In practice, it looks a little bit different. So you'll have to come and see the exhibition itself to see how it fully came together. So this is the room on the Jewish diaspora. You could see a number of these different photos, including Yochaved Barber right here where my mouse is, April of 1943. You can really see on the ceiling, all of the different photos showing all of these different events happening at once in April, 1943. This is the room on Jews and Judaism. It's really this celebratory vibrant space. Right here in the center is the Steinberger Sukkah. There Within the actual exhibition, you're able to see both the upper and the lower panel of this illuminated manuscript that Arya Steinberger had made 
to be hung in Osaka in Hungary in the 1920s. And it's a really special space to be able to step into and read the prayers that he had written on there and look at all of the different beautiful drawings that he had included, both of Hungary and of pre-state Israel and of biblical scenes. Here is the room on historical anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Modern Jewish responses from 1881 to 1933. This is the room on Nazi Germany. Flight and Jewish responses. You can see right here is the piano that belonged to Hetty that we had been speaking about. Nazi expansion. So you can see here are the 36 yellow stars, including photos of various different individuals wearing their yellow star. Ghettos. The final solution in the German conquered Soviet Union. Roundups, deportations, and factories of murder. Hiding, escape, and resistance. And you can actually see right here where my mouse is, is Anita Meyer, whose yellow star I had spoken about earlier and whose diary is on view in this case right here, and who I believe is here with us on Zoom right now. And that's Gerdica right here. Concentration camps. What the world knew and did. Death marches, liberation, and beginning again. And obviously we've been showing you a number of the different objects and of the text and the various ways that we tell stories in this exhibition. Another way is through 28 various different videos, an interactive and a soundscape that both have historical footage, historical sounds and testimonies. And throughout the entire exhibition, it was very important to the curatorial team for people to hear the stories from survivors themselves and to really be centering these survivor voices. And so you can see right here in our final room in that closing message video where we're giving survivors the last word. These are three different survivors, many of which actually have objects earlier on in the exhibition and whose testimonies are shown also in other places. You can see here are some of their messages at the top from Annalise Hertz. But if you ask me also, are you happy that you survived? I could not give you an unqualified yes. The main point is that I live, but I really don't live part of me died. And so that we have time for more of the questions and throughout for the q and I I won't read fully these different, all three of these quotes, but just for you to know as you're walking through the exhibition that you'll be able to hear from survivors themselves, their stories. And oftentimes, if someone's object, we also have a testimony from them, then their testimony is shown next to or very close to the object. For example, Judy had spoken earlier about Chaya Porus's blouse. Her testimony is playing right next to it. So not only can you read her story, you can hear from her about getting that blouse from Luba Gorowitz, about wearing it with her when she escaped into the woods and fought with Nakama, and about her towel that she had also recovered from her sister and from the ruins at and that she had worn and she had kept with her to wipe her tears when she was fighting. So you can hear from her herself and from all the different people who we are lucky enough to have so many testimonies and historical footage in our museum's collection to be able to share with you and in this exhibition. So now I'll hand it back to Judy and then we would love to open it up for questions for Q&A. Okay, um, the only thing that I have to say is that this is really an incredible exhibition. Now. You can't imagine how much is invested in putting together something like this because every object that we take, we feel, we cry over, we try to understand who the people were because that's what we're trying to get across to all of you, that the Holocaust really happened to individual people, not a group of 6 million, but one times 6 million. And over and over again, we tell the story of that one. And we will be honored if you will come and visit the exhibition in order to learn together with us as we did the stories of one and another and another and another 
so that we never forget. Because it's the only thing that we can do at this time in order to honor those people who did not survive. Questions and answers? Um, so yeah, I will be asking the questions. I just want to say thank you, Judy and Becky. That was a really excellent presentation. And I think we have time for just a couple questions. So I'll start out with an easy one. Um, how many objects oh, thereabouts are on display? About 750 objects are on display in the exhibition, 98% okay. coming from our museum's collection. Um, awesome. And then we had a fair amount of questions about um, Sephardic stories in the exhibition. So I'm not gonna ask the more specific ones, but if you could just sort of talk about the importance of including Sephardic stories in the exhibition and how you did that, I think that'd be great. Okay, do you want me to take this one? Um, we have a tremendous inclusion, not only of European Sephardim, but as we've seen from Libya, North African Sephardim, they're mentioned, their objects exist, um, their stories exist. They're very much starting with the mikvah clogs, going for pictures of children from Greece, from Bulgaria, from other, from, from parts of Turkey, stories of Muslim women who saved Jews in Bulgaria, the stories of Sephardic Jews who reach the concentration camps and what happens to them. We have them in texts, we have them in movies, we have them all over the place. This is not your average, European Ashkenazi-centered um, exhibition. We have made great efforts to include as many groups as possible in order for visitors to receive a panorama picture of everything that went on. Nazis didn't dis make a distinction between European Spartan and European Ashkenazi. And the story of North Africa is a little bit different, but we have that as well. It's all there, come and see it. Especially in our room on Jews and Judaism, you're able to see so much Judaica and ritual objects that belong to Sephardic individuals pre-war. And you know, we have the mikvah clogs that we spoke about, but we also have tefillin from Syria and a ketubah from Morocco and another ketubah from Yemen and from Iran. And we really speak about a number of different Sephardic stories through their objects and it's special to really see in this celebratory space in the Jews and Judaism room, all of those different objects from all the different countries. Because within that room as well, there are objects from over 30 different countries. And then I think we'll just end with this question. Um, if you both feel comfortable answering this, can you talk about, Judy, I know you, you spoke a bit about this during the presentation, but sort of the, the impact that working on this exhibition has had on you um, both uh, professionally and personally, if you feel comfortable talking about that. Yeah, as I said before, this is probably, I would say the high point of my professional life. And on the personal level, there are objects and there are stories that have to do, because I grew up surrounded both family-wise and school-wise and every place by Holocaust survivors and by the stories who didn't survive. And it became my profession. I feel connected to everyone, to everything. Somebody wrote in the questions, I was reading them as they were coming up. How do you do it without a stream of tears? You don't, you don't, you cry through it. You take a package of tissues when you come because these people deserve to be cried over. I can only quote what my own mother said to me once, many, many, many years ago, my late mother said to me, it's okay if you cry when I die. So yes, it is okay if we cry when we see what happened to to these people, to the Jews and to the non-Jews and to the fellow travelers of Jews who were murdered by the Nazis. Yes, we cry. God help us if we wouldn't. So come with tissues. Yeah, I, I think I really echo a lot of what Judy said. Part of what's so powerful about this exhibition is how personal it is. And both getting to know the people, many of them, survivors that are still alive, getting to know them and hear the stories from them themselves. It's been so special to then put that into the exhibition and to really be able to learn from them. And we hope that visitors can feel that same personal human collect connection and that it's not six million, it's Yochavet Farber and all of these different individual people that you can actually connect to. And I think for me as well, I, my grandmother was a Holocaust survivor. And so it was something that 
I grew up learning about as well. And she's her birth certificates in the exhibition telling her story. And I think it's a, such a personal show in so many different ways, both for us as the team that was working on it and for the museum community and the different voices that we're able to share and that we hope people really connect to and learn from. And so many people know the history of the Holocaust and various different details of it, but they don't know these people and they don't know these people's stories. And that's what's so special about it and that we hope you'll all be able to come see when you come see the exhibition. Well, I want to say thank you so much again to both of you. This has been a really um, amazing presentation. I personally learned so much. Um, and I also want to thank everyone out there for joining us today, especially the descendants of Holocaust survivors and the Holocaust survivors who I know have been on. Um, and just to say uh, that this is our permanent exhibition. So it's going to be here for a very long time, but we hope that you all will um, come see it. And uh, just a reminder, everything we do at the museum is made possible through donor support. So to those of you watching, we hope you'll consider making a donation to support the museum or becoming a member and joining us for our upcoming programs, all of which you can check out at the link in the Zoom chat. Of course, we hope you'll come and see um, the Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, which you can also find out more information um, at the links in the chat. Um, thank you again, Judy and Becky. Have a great afternoon um, and we hope to see you all again. Thank you for joining us.